Hong Kong. And I think what we've seen in recent years is that identification has become uh, a core development goal. We see uh, legal proof of identity in the context of the sustainable development goals. We've seen the launch uh, of the World Bank's ID for Development project. Uh, and it's something that from the standpoint not only of financial inclusion, but of a wide range of different services, lack of identity is a core development problem in a very large number of countries around the world. But we also have had in recent years uh, a number of initiatives, uh, probably the highest profile in, in India with the Aadhaar system, where countries have developed systems of digital biometric ID, which are the basis not only of financial inclusion systems, but also of a wider range of government services. So these are the sorts of things that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to begin with our theme setter. Our theme setter is uh, Katie Rungasinga from uh, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, who will come and give us uh, a bit of an opening on, on the scene. Then after that, uh, in addition to KD, we'll invite a panel of speakers up who will each take a few minutes to talk about the experiences that they've had in the context of their countries developing or implementing digital identification systems. When we think about digital ID, it's not just individuals, but also businesses uh, and companies. And we're going to make sure that we leave a lot of time for questions uh, and input from the audience. So, KD, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. <coughs> yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, right. Thank you, Douglas, for that uh, introduction. Distinguished uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. <coughs> Thanks for AFI for the invitation. And uh, also, I should be thankful to the Russian uh, Central Bank of Russian Federation for the hospitality. <clears throat> and also congratulations uh, for AFI's uh, 10th anniversary. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of our greatest ICT revolution. Today in the morning, you would remember the first uh, deputy governor of the uh, Central Bank of Russian Federation uh, characterized that as a technological uh, explosion. Uh, the, the digital revolution has changed the way the world works, the world learns, communicates, does business, and treat illness. It provides uh, immense opportunities for progress in all walks of life in all countries. We should harness this for the promotion of financial inclusion as well. Look at this chart. Uh, this is uh, about uh, subscribers to mobile telephone and internet. Mobile telephone subscription has, uh, during the last uh, few years, as reported by the International Telecommunication Union, uh, the subscribers have been growing exponentially. In LDCs, subscribers per 100 inhabitants at five in 2005 has increased to 70 by 2017, by 14 fold. Similarly, individuals using internet has also increased from 1% in 2005 to 18% in 2017 in LDCs. And the numbers are growing. This, is, this expansion in digital technologies bring more choice and greater convenience and opportunities for the population, including for access to finance. However, despite progress, we see large gaps in financial inclusion across regions, across income levels, and across gender. Yeah, see this uh, graph. In comparison to high-income countries, accounts with a formal financial institution is significantly low in low-income countries. 
that is uh, 35 percent, uh, 35 against uh, 94. There is a disparity between men and women as well. At the same time, use of financial services are also very low in low-income countries. Even when access is available, uh, financial services are not being used. For example, only 8 percent of people have borrowed from uh, financial institutions uh, in LDCs compared to high number. Almost everybody is uh, uh, doing a loan in the advanced countries. Improved access to use fi formal financial services are seen by policymakers as a way of improving people's livelihood, reduce poverty, and advance economic development. Now let us uh, look at uh, population without a uh, legal identity. <coughs> uh, estimated global population without a proof of uh, legal identity is about 1 billion. The proportion in the low income countries is estimated to be very high at 43% compared to 2% in high income countries. So what is the digital ID? Identity is at the core of the authenticity of social interactions and the integrity of business processes. ID, identity is the starting point of any relationship, trust and confidence in, or in ongoing interactions between individuals, organizations and government. Identity is critical to be able to distinguish individuals from one another so that services can be delivered to the right individual. Uh, why a digital ID matters? I would like to draw your attention to the uh, last sentence of uh, this uh, statement. Financial institutions uh, require client verification before disbursing a loan or market transfers. This is the critical requirement for assessing formal financial services. The, the identity card is the license to open an account at a formal financial institution. Due to mandatory know your customer requirement as well as uh, AMT and uh, CFT uh, regulations, formal financial institutions will not open account without acceptable identification. Even with you have a paper type identification, then uh, banks will ask you to have a one-to-one, one face-to-face -one, -one, -face interview before op opening an account. Therefore, provision of digital IT to both who currently does not have any identification and to those who are having paper IDs are equally important to scale up financial inclusion. Governor Bank of Kenya today in the morning highlighted that uh, with the digital IDs in place uh, uh, in, in Kenya, they were able to open uh, 200,000 uh, agency banks countrywide. Uh, providing a legal identity has been emphasized in uh, sustainable development goals also under uh, 16, under goal, sorry, under target uh, 16.9. Not only that, uh, at least uh, uh, another 10 sustainable development goals highlighted the requirement of any form of identity card. Let me skip this. And uh, some country specific uh, digital IDs. Uh, high income countries like uh, Belgium, Estonia, uh, Finland, France, and uh, Republic of Korea, and Singapore are some of the countries uh, leveraging existing physical identity cards infrastructure to create a digital ID ecosystem, enabling them to deliver public services more efficiently. In low-income countries, such as uh, uh, Bangladesh, Guyana, and Kenya, they are also have uh, established some mode of uh, uh, digital ID systems. Middle-income countries, for example, 
uh, Albania, India, Moldova, and Pakistan have also established digital ID and gaining benefits. A digital ID infrastructure may include biometrics, digital data bases, digital credentials, mobile online and uh, offline applications. Setup and uh, management of these systems can be costly for developing countries. Governance, governments can establish public-private partnerships with companies to deliver the initial financial burden, create revenue flows and ensure sustainability. The benefits of uh, digital ID are already been realized in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. In Botswana, for example, biometric enrollment of uh, pensions, social grants resulted in 25% savings by identifying and cutting numbers that were inflated by duplicate records. And diseased beneficiaries have also been drawn these benefits that was stopped. Similarly, in Nigeria, biometric audits reduce the federal pension role by an impressive 40 percent. We have a panelist from Nigeria. We can uh, get to know more information about that. Providing financial services for disabled and mobility impaired people are also possible under the digital ID systems. Next. There are risks, ladies and gentlemen. We have to be mindful about the various risks associated with issuing digital ID. A major one is privacy risk. Uh, and in, in addition to that, next. In addition to that, uh, there are uh, many more risk elements. For example, legal and regulatory risk, institutional and administrative risk, technological risk, business models and procurement risk, country specific cross border risk, as well as uh, cyber security risk. We discussed those today in the morning. ID and uh, financial inclusion uh, success story. Uh, we, when by now we have discussed several times. Douglas also highlighted uh, at the at his briefing uh, in India before the development of uh, ADA uh, government led 12-digit unique biometric identification program. Many individuals lack the documentation necessary to open an account. The ADA system introduced in uh, 2010 has allowed many in India to enter the formal financial system. Uh, ADA has uh, significantly reduced the KYC cost. Since the launch, over 300 million, today that number was confirmed by our World Bank uh, panelist, over 300 million new bank accounts have been opened. The data shows that more than 56% of the enrollees did not previously carry a formal identification. Finally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yesterday and today in the morning also we discussed that uh, during last 10-year uh, period, uh, AFI's operation uh, resulted in bringing 630,000 people into the financial financial inclusion from uh, non-bank holders to bank bank holders within few years with the digital id india was able to bring in 6 uh, three, 300 million to the financial inclusion network so that itself that itself uh, uh, highlight the importance of uh, uh, digital ID system to promote financial inclusion. The use may be lower, the use of uh, financial system that we'll have to add separately. But uh, the first thing is to open an account. So that has been enabled under the digital ID system. <coughs> uh, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, digital ID is a, I would say, game changer. And a force multiplier in the 
global push towards access to finance and poverty alleviation, the digital ID system would be an essential part. Thank you very much. Thanks, Katie, and I think that's an excellent um, framework for the remainder of our discussions. If I could invite you and our other panelists up on stage um, to uh, begin the, the next segment of the discussion. Um, we have with us uh, Amir Ahmed from uh, Central Bank of Jordan, uh, Leon Perlman uh, from Digital Financial Services Observatory at Columbia University. We have Yuri Bozor from uh, the Bank of Russia, we have Joe uh, Abogo from Central Bank of Nigeria and KD Ronga Singh from uh, Central Bank of, of Sri Lanka. Um, and what I would like to do is uh, just ask each of you, uh, you know, a question to hear about your experiences. And Amir, I was in Jordan uh, for the AFI meetings there in, in April, uh, and one of the most fascinating projects I heard about uh, involved some of your challenges uh, around forcibly displaced persons and some of your coordinating efforts with the UN and others in building technological solutions to some of those. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you, Douglas. Thank you for the question, and thanks for, for the invitation for being here. Well, first of all, I mean, one of our main challenges was to financially include the forcibly displaced persons. And what we have done, we've realized that the main challenge was to provide them with ID because most of them who come, especially given the, the political atmosphere in their region and the, uh, the, the, the current refugees uh, entering in Jordan, so most of them don't have uh, IDs. So in 2016, there's uh, an initiative that was launched, which is uh, by a company called Iris Guard. Uh, it's a public-private partnership. It's, um, it's a secured, encrypted network that can authenticate uh, refugees to receive their aid through uh, banks, through ATM, uh, switch ATM network through a specific bank who was part of, of this. And the data is stored in the UNHCR database. So doing that, um, since 2016, 90% of refugees in Jordan have been registered biometrically, uh, which gives us more than 600,000 refugee who is who are receiving aid through through this network, which and have a biometric ID in the system as well. And what we have done, uh, we have again amended our regulatory framework to for, uh, to allow them to open digital wallets. I mean, considering and knowing the high cost of maintaining a bank account, and most banks don't open accounts for refugees. So we've eased the the. We solved the problem by letting them or approving the UNHCR card as an approved identification, means of identification to open up digital wallet as well. So to go forward, we've, uh, by the beginning of this year, in February, we've launched an initiative called Mobile Money for Resilience. And the main purpose of, of this initiative is to allow or to connect uh, interested donors, uh, humanitarian agencies, and uh, beneficiaries, uh, re refugees and low-income Jordanians, so, and dealing with the private sector as well to, to come up with or to promote innovation in this, at, in this realm so they can promote or they can develop uh, fintech, financial technologies that can uh, financially include our uh, our target groups, which is refugees and uh, low-income Jordanians. So what we're looking at is leveraging on the IRIS, the IRIS network that is, uh, is there so we can develop other uh, financial technologies that can, that can utilize this, this rich 
database. And as we speak, the, uh, in Jordan as well, the wor World Food Program is currently, because we, we have currently nine humanitarian agencies as third parties connecting to this data, data store, to this database, so they can distribute data aid through, uh, through authentication or through using this, uh, this data. Now the IFC is supporting Iris Guard to go regional, so we can uh, register more than 2.3 million refugees in five countries regionally. So we can ensure no duplication of refugees and that we can ensure that they have a uh, financial history as well if they move again or if they go back home. So that's in a nutshell and uh, welcome any questions. Yeah, well, we'll save your questions uh, until the end. I had one quick question for you and that was, um, are you using this or rolling it out for, for Jordanians at all as well? Actually, actually, yes, but that's on another level because the Jordanian authorities recently have developed the new identification uh, database which required all Jordanian citizens to renew their ID cards, which includes storing or capturing biometric information like uh, stamp or and iris as well. So what we're looking is this is the, the let's say the grassroots of of our development of, of our financial infrastructure. What we're looking for is on the long run having our regulatory sandbox in place too, to to, prom to promote innovation in the financial sector and our initiatives to support the financial sector to come up with solutions that can that can enhance and uh, I mean having in co into consideration our AML CFT. Mm. Uh, concerns to come up with solutions to enhance onboarding and to enhance financially included initiatives and uh, I mean after all to lift people out of poverty and enhance quality of, uh, of living. Thank you very much. Um, Yuri, turning to, to the Russian experience, I think we've heard uh, this morning uh, in the opening session and also in the plenary just before lunch about the very I think exciting uh, experience uh, of Russia in, in using technology for financial inclusion and digital financial transformation. Um, my, I believe that you're responsible for one of the areas going forward that in many countries is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, the last mile of, of disabled persons and others with barriers to systems. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about sort of Russia's experience in building digital ID system, but also your strategies and approaches in reaching this last group. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I won't just in uh, pair uh, sentences uh, describe the um, uh, way of Russia Central Bank for financial inclusion for disabled people. So about the last mile, it's very important for our country. And we also do, uh, do something about this. Uh, but uh, I th hope, I think it's very interesting to um, take, uh, take into account the, a lot of people with disabilities. In Russia, it's about uh, 13 million people with uh, different kinds of disabilities. And so it's uh, hard to overestimate the importance of uh, remote and biometric uh, identification in this case. Uh, and uh, our main goal uh, that the new technologies, FinTech, must break the barriers and not install new barriers. For example, about uh, six to seven years ago, uh, a lot of banks uh, install the uh, intellectual voice response uh, system in the, the customer in customer uh, service and system. It's uh, the goal of this is decrease the uh, price of servicing, include the quality, but this intellectual voice response automatically creates the barrier for people with problem of uh, uh, hear and, and 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 speech, because the uh, if. Uh, for deaf people, for deaf people, is practically not because uh, they cannot use uh, this intellectual voice response system uh, for uh, uh, financial inclusion. So uh, when we dis decide uh, the how we, we can um, 
install the beyond biometric system, we choose the two parameters generally, its voice uh, recognition and uh, face. Face, uh, picture of the face and some dynamic kind of uh, picture of the face. This is, uh, uh, this uh, two parameters, two biometric parameters uh, is, um, in addition, we use the uniform state uh, system of identification and authentication. So these three parameters uh, fulfill now uh, um, in the biometric identification for most population, but people with problem of speech and uh, the hair, and uh, these people practically exclude from this system because uh, this, uh, they can't uh, speak uh, properly. And also uh, other kind of people with uh, problem with speech also have problem. So we, uh, now we are thinking about uh, to uh, add some additional parameters. It's a palm vein uh, pattern, maybe fingerprint, and to uh, extend the biometric system for these people. Also concerning the security, the biometric data store uh, quite separately from the personal data. And this is the rule in Russia and very strict uh, rules, uh, cryptographic rules for storing this information. So uh, we start this system June uh, of this year. Now about 20% of banking uh, offices uh, can uh, collect biometric data. And we expect till the end of uh, next year that 100% of banking uh, offices and branches uh, can receive and uh, use the biometric in in data for identification. So it will, will be very important for people and uh, also for people with disability and people, uh, people who live in uh, rural, remote and other area with the lack of uh, financial, financial services and financial inclusion. Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, is, is very interesting approach. And I had, you know, one question from the slides in the plenary just before lunch, and that was one that really struck me, which was about 10 million people uh, who lived in rural parts of the country with essentially no access to modern communication systems. And I wondered in the context of those areas of the country, um, what sort of initiatives you're taking in terms of linking up to communication services? Uh, thank you for this question. It's very important for us because uh, these 10 million people, it's uh, also our citizens and they have uh, the right to receive the modern financial services. Now, Russian government uh, uh, practically finished, maybe on the middle of the program, to um, give internet access for uh, town from 500 to 250 inhabitants for free. Uh, so I think till the end of next year, all small cities in Russia will have the free access to internet. Uh, so it will be very important for financial inclusion. And based on this, we start the pilot project on Far East region on Russia, just to increase the uh, financial inclusion exactly for this uh, population. And we hope the, our <laughs> KPI it's to 220, increase twice the number of small cities. I mean the cities with less than 1,000 inhabitants, uh, twice increase the number of point of access point to financial services and the uh, internet and communication is the base of this uh, aim and I think uh, without this we can't uh, fulfill our KPI. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. That's uh, I think very interesting. Uh, turning to to Nigeria, Joe. I, I turning switching direction a little bit from the idea of, of personal ID to um, uh, essentially banking identification numbers. Can you tell us a little bit about the experience of Nigeria and also its relationship to uh, the national ID system? Okay, um, thank you, um, Douglas. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'll give a, a brief uh, 
uh, history on why you know we went into the bank uh, verification number. Now, when the National Financial Inclusion Strategy was uh, launched in October 2012 by the Central Bank or by the Federal Government, the main goal was to achieve 20% financial exclusion rate away from what we had then, 46.3%. And um, we identified that uh, one of uh, the barriers to financial inclusion you know, was uh, the cumbersome requirements for accounts opening you know, by the um, rural populace. So what the bank did in 2013 was to lower the guard, you know, the requirements for opening of accounts. And it was by tiering the KYC requirements into three. We had three tiered KYC requirements, levels one to three. And it was basically to, you know, lower account uh, opening requirements, you know, to, um, like, you can, you know, open an account without any amount at all. Now, in order to complement uh, you know, the KYC requirements and to address uh, the issues of a uh, unique identifier, the bank, in collaboration with the Bankers Committee, you know, Bankers Committee uh, you know, is made up of uh, the bank CEOs. So it was you know, in 2014 that the bank, and in collaboration with the Bankers Committee, launched the bank verification number. Now, what is uh, this bank verification number? It is uh, simply a centralized biometric identification system for the banking system. So it is just basically for the banking system and not, nothing else. Now, what, what, was, uh, the, or what were the objectives for you know, um, starting this uh, project? It was uh, basically to reduce uh, identity theft you know, it is known that uh, no, no, um, no uh, two individuals have similar, you know, um, similar features. That one is a uh, given. Then it was also to protect bank customers and, you know, to restrain unauthorized access to customers' accounts. It was also, you know, put in place to reduce incidences of uh, fraud in the banking system. And, um, you know, as it relates to our gathering, it was to, again, engender financial inclusion, you know, amongst uh, the unbanked uh, populace. Now, since uh, the introduction of uh, the bank verification number in 2014, it, the, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, mileage attained. And the impact has, you know, been in form of uh, confidence building and trust. The first impact was, you know, that of confidence building and trust amongst the, you know, banking populace. The second one was, uh, you know, for uh, the access to micro uh, micro credits by the unbanked. Now, before uh, credits are, you know, given to the unbanked, they would uh, allow you to enroll with, I mean, a, a BVN. And that, in essence, brings you to the formal financial services. Instances of, um, you know, government initiatives that uh, the uh, unbanked have benefited, you know, include the uh, anchor borrowers program of the federal government. This is uh, an initiative that the, the unbanked or the rural populace, you know, are giving loans, micro loans, to access. Uh, agri products, uh, mainly agri produce, and this has helped a lot of uh, you know the banks in the rural areas to you know be big time farmers. It is also for um, petty traders to be given uh, um, micro access loans, micro loans to uh, you know enhance uh, their trading uh, 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 job. Now it is also it has also helped uh, to ensure. Uh, savings culture amongst uh, the you know, populace. In as much as you are able to get uh, micro loans, the process of uh, you know, your, your endeavors can also be saved. And it also en engenders uh, payments as well. So it has helped in so many ways. And with this, 
the economic activities of uh, the rural populace has, uh, you know, increased uh, significantly. We have uh, some uh, challenges of uh, not getting enough mileage in terms of uh, the number of uh, people brought into the former financial uh, um, circle. Although I don't have uh, figures to give now, we are making, uh, you know, we got uh, this notice at a very short uh, time, so we couldn't get uh, figures to substantiate uh, some of these things. And for this, the bank has put in place another initiative, which is, uh, you know, it was launched in April this year. It is called SANEP, Shared Agent Network Facility. The objective of this, again, is to bring in, I mean, uh, to extend the financial services or, you know, to the rural areas. It is a, a facility that, you know, w uh, has been given to the mobile money operators, super agents, and the banks to deploy agent networks across the rural areas. It, this is expected to bring in, you know, more uh, uh, unbanked into the former financial service. We are targeting about 40 million of such in the year 2020. In the same way, they are also to, um, they, they, they are also to enroll non-bank account holders, and we are also targeting about 40 million, you know, within the year as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, it, it's, it's a major project in large countries, these sorts of initiatives. One question, in order for the banking system to use this, did you have to make any legal or regulatory changes? Yeah, we, they, there are regulatory uh, guidelines put in place for you know, the bank verification number. We have guidelines mm -hmm. as well as guidelines on BVN watch list. And what that means is that um, they are prone to be fraudsters within the system. If you are caught, you have to be, you, you, you'll be taken out of the you know, former financial system. That will be the punishment. We have guidelines you know, in, in, in place. And uh, in terms of uh, linkage to the national ID system, we have in place the National Identity Management Commission. At the end of the day, the bank verification number is you know, synchronized with the national ID and you know, we have a single national identity number. Very good. Um, I think I wanted to turn to, to Leon because Leon has the advantage of having worked on multiple systems in multiple countries. And so maybe um, some of your uh, experiences or lessons that you can draw from those projects. Thanks. You're quite right. That, um, <clears throat> so I, I, at Columbia, we do studies on identity systems, EKYC, cybersecurity, etc. Uh, and I also have the advantage of, of doing a lot of gap analysis in the field um, in uh, East Africa, Latin America, um, and Asia, and um, while it's welcoming to see all these EKYC and uh, national ID systems um, developing, the, the overriding theme over the past few years of, of doing this is I, I see, uh, while it's really aspirational, there's a lack of coordination. Mm. That's to me the overriding thing. Um, coordination both at a regional level, uh, within country, uh, even within regulatory institutions, and even parallel systems um, from private institutions. Mm -hmm. So one bank will have one mm -hmm. system. Okay, so this is really duplicative and, and uh, very expensive. Um, and what you, wh what, you, what you need to see is a holistic approach. I've actually refereed, if you will, as a facilitator, um, uh, meetings where regulators have to discuss how to implement this. And nobody wants to give up their silo. Okay, it's everybody says, I'm, I'm the boss of that, right? Okay. So I, I've actually worked with uh, Amar and Jordan, he's seen that. Um, there's been some very interesting meetings we've been in, and I, I actually, to that point, I've uh, been very impressed with what they've been uh, doing in Jordan. I've, I've been working there on and uh, off for a couple of years now. 
In fact, doing an assessment uh, very recently of the UNHCR sign-up uh, process. Uh, in fact, I'm a um, Syrian refugee. Well, in the database, but not a real one, right? So I went through that whole process, um, doing the iris scanning, and uh, it's it's uh, it's being implemented in the in the refugee camps where you can use the iris scan for for payment. But there's a parallel system. Karaman Bank, the ATMs have got their own iris scan. So you, there are these parallel systems. If they were all integrated, wonderful. Um, now at uh, at a national level, I mean the exemplar. Uh, of where there was a coordination failure, I think, um, sorry to pick on them, but Uganda, um, a few months ago with the SIM card registration uh, issue, um, where there wasn't an API established between the, um, the, the telcos and the uh, regulator and the national ID folks. Okay, so they, they cut off people. Effectively, for a few months, you couldn't get a SIM card. So if you had a mobile money account, tough. The only thing you could do was cash out. You couldn't do any transactions. And there was a direct um, issue of coordination failure. Now let me say this, is that uh, the, the idea that you've got biometric IDs and it's Nirvana and you put your fingerprint down or you scan and that's it, it's all electronic, that's a misnomer, okay. If you look at the, 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 the fact of guidelines, there always needs to be some sort of backup. So that involves an analog process. There's going to be a photocopy or a copy or a scan, and somebody needs to sign that, and that needs to go to a back office. So, okay, we've got everybody on board, but there's still that other process, that backup process that you need to take into account. That's essentially your risk-based approach, is don't put your eggs in one basket. What happens if you've got a failure? Now, to that point, your technology is very important. Okay, so you get these smart cards. The smart cards are wonderful, but they, they require a lot of back-end enterprise-level processes. Now, the smart card, if you even, even the best technology that's out there is limited uh, in terms of memory. So no, none of these smart cards will, will, um, will uh, store iris. It's too big. The, the JPEGs or whatever you're going to use are too big for this. So it needs a, a online facility. That online facility needs to be in place. There needs to be APIs, et cetera, et cetera. Is that in place? Okay, so what are you launching with? Other thing is you've got digital signatures. Is there, who's the certification authority? Right? Um, then the readers themselves, that needs to be certified by maybe some national uh, IT body. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this. There's a thread of coordination that needs to take place. It's not easy. So I'm, I'm doing some work in um, East Africa now. I'm busy on a, um, a, a developing a national payment system, and we did some industry workshops, and the, although putting your finger down and everybody's, you know, kumbaya, we're all going to be enrolled, ID was the last thing they wanted because it was too difficult. Now, financial, it's counterintuitive to think of it that you can enroll everybody. We've got ID4 uh, development, and it's going to improve financial inclusion. In that case, it would actually handicap it because building the national payment system was more important than integrating on IDs. ID, long time. Um, so, like, well, at a, at a regional level, you've got the East African community trying to build a system. You've got uh, the, the one the one network, I think it's called, where three countries are trying to uh, equilibrate their, their SIM card registration system with the EKYC. That's also going to take a long time. But as I'm saying, aspirational versus reality, a lot of coordination that needs to take place. Yeah, I think that's one of the key themes that comes out in, in questions and discussions with countries around the world is coordination. And in particular, that many of these functions are outside of the scope of uh, the central bank or the regulatory authorities. Yeah. I'd like to ask you some questions, but I'm conscious that we're short on time. And so what I'll I'm going to do is open it up to the audience. Um, so maybe we can take, let's say, three questions and then open it up to the panel. Good afternoon. I am Georges de Genouy from the Central Bank of Haiti. 
I have a question because I don't know which one of you will be able to answer it, but I'll put it anyway. There was a project, there is a project that is being launched right now, it's still in project, where the government is trying, our government is trying to launch an identification card, but at the same time, they would like to use it as a, a bank account. I say bank, but it can be in other, first of all, to give, uh, people can be identified, that's the mean. And secondly, if they want to pass subsidies or if the person wants to use it, I mean, this is something that's being launched. I am at the uh, central bank. Uh, the entity that thinking of launching that is the uh, internal revenue services in Haiti. In other, I mean, they want to use it for tax reasons and everything else. We are, I am at the central bank, they kind of, they linked it to financial inclusion. And I would like to know from that panel we have here, does any one of you have that type of system in their own country? What are the pros and what are the cons? Thank you. Okay, let's start. Ah, there's one more back there, I see. Thank you very much. My name is David Mien from Eswatini. I have a question in terms of people from the panel who can help. I think my issue is how can we then integrate, since currently we have several systems that are used for identification. We have the personal identification number, we have the tax number, and we also register cars. So we have various avenues through which they provide a semblance in terms of who owns what and the credentials. I think we need some experience on how we can put together all the elements and come up with a system that will be more simpler to use and that at the same time be more friendlier. We reduce the element of having to be physically there to submit the documentation and provide the proof. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that uh, very good questions. I am not an IT expert. I think uh, some one also will add some points. <clears throat> the question from uh, IT, uh, you know, th th this is, uh, I think, an answer to the question what uh, the second gentleman asked. What you are saying is uh, sort of integrated one, right? All uh, Indian revenue, uh, other maybe motor, registration, different institutions can have the same, and banks also can use the same, no? Um, for the identification be universal. Yes. But at the same time, they want to use that same identity card linked to the bank account. Yeah, Th that's right. I don't know if you heard me. Yeah. I say in terms of identity, it's yeah. universal. So yeah. that's why you want it digital so everybody everywhere can use it. Yeah. My question was more on the other side, on the payment side of it. I'm asking that question because the bankers, they have thinking, because when you give a credit card to somebody, it has an expiration date, he has this, he has that, he has that. You can lose it and things like that. But when you're talking about identification card, it has no expiration dates. It has to be there forever. So how, what are the pros and the cons, and is there any experiences like that that has been done? And uh, <coughs> yeah, that is, that's right. Uh, this is a sort of a privacy issue, right? Because uh, whether the, some credentials should be revealed to some other third party. 
but uh, this type of information we are also now in the process of uh, introducing a digital identity card biometric identity card so there there will be a central point where they manage the data and uh, the the information will be provided on the request with the with the consent of the uh, you know owner of the data so that is the understanding that uh, we are having right now not to reveal everything without the consent of the uh, person who, who who belongs the data set. So that is uh, my response. Uh. Okay, I I want to respond to the gentleman's uh, question. You know about uh, several identity issuing uh, authorities. Um, we have a similar situation in Nigeria where if you want to obtain a, a driving license, for instance, your biometrics will be captured. If you want to obtain international passport, your um, biometrics will be captured. The same thing for um, uh, SIM registration, you know, mobile money operators, um, as well as uh, the you know, bank uh, IDs that I just uh, you know, mentioned. I think it's as a result of a uh, failure of uh, national identity management system. Once you have a national ID system, the whole of these should be able to you know, talk to each other, and at the end of the day, a unique ID will be issued you know, to the um, individual. What we are doing now is that, like for instance, the bank verification number, once it is linked to the National Identity Management Commission, a unique ID will be issued so that if you don't go to the National Identity Commission to you know, get your ID for that, uh, maybe the national ID, with the bank verification number, the, the commission will issue the national ID card for you. So that is the, what I have for that. Okay, I'll try. Uh, in Russia, we have a different kind of system for identification. Uh, but the one problem is not exist that all people have the legal ID. This is on paper, but it's all people uh, have a legal ID on a paper. Now we um, establish and um, successfully work on the united system of identification and authentication. This system connects with other government system. In the idea is the person have just one point of entry. This is the uh, personal um, cabinet of this uh, system. So uh, this year we establish uh, biometric identification system. This separate system. So uh, for identification we use two. Uh, two sources. One source is the United System of Authentication Identification and United uh, Biometric System. Data store separately and uh, this, uh, we hope this helps us to increase the safety of this uh, system and uh, decrease the probability of uh, identification. Chief. So, um, Again, the, the Nirvana is, as we've spoken about, one universal ID, one universal ID number. You get it, it's yours. Put it on the blockchain, self-sovereign, whatever. But you, within a national context, you get one ID number. That's the Nirvana. But let me say that you need to think ahead is what can you do with that? Mm. Okay, so what's the policy lay on top of that? So it's especially for financial inclusion purposes, okay, you get that ID number and you can go and get a SIM card. Okay, and you might, might depending on the jurisdiction, be able to uh, simultaneously open up a mobile money DFS mm -hmm. account. But that ID number is not the same as attestation. It doesn't, it's not a due diligence, it doesn't say Leon's good for, he's not a bad guy, he's gonna launder money, you know, or, or, or whatever. So w what's holding up financial inclusion is that next layer, it's a policy layer. It says, what are you going to do with it? Okay, even in India, with Aadhaar mm. is, our, you know, is our bellwether of digital ID. Look how many fights there are about what you can do with it. Can you pay your tax? Has a tax authority got access to it? Pension, whatever. So 
fantastic. The technology is in place and you've got the whole infrastructure, but you still need to build that policy layer on top of it. And to me, if you can, um, equilibrate the, the uh, SIM card sign-up process with opening a, up an account, at least at a basic level, then, then you're doing, doing good. Accepted that on a risk-based approach, you're going to need some sort of attestation that I'm not a bad guy and I'm going to run, run a mock and do uh, money laundering stuff with it. You might need some additional uh, verification address or whatever. Uh, uh, that's part of ongoing customer due diligence. I mean, that's that even if you have the best ID systems in the world. But at the very least, don't duplicate things by needing a different ID or different sign-up process, SIM card versus at least a basic mobile money account. Let me just add a couple of, of points on that because I think this is something that we'll actually talk about in the, the plenary session. We're seeing an increasing number of countries that are designing these sorts of integrated systems and it offers tremendous synergies if, as Leon says, you think through the different interconnections and how the system works. And that, if we look at the Indian example, uh, the strategy is called the India Stack Strategy, is a, exactly about that linking your base ID to your simplified account opening to your EKYC system to an open electronic payment system to a variety of government provision of services systems, all to provide essentially a transformative infrastructure for the economy. And it's something we're seeing an increasing range of countries doing very effectively, but it is a challenge in the context of design. But the good news is we have more and more experiences that we can look at and we can talk about some of those if you'd like. From the standpoint of disparate IDs, this is something that um, many countries have a real policy challenge in not being able to have a single national ID. And so we're getting an increasing range of systems which are exactly as Katie said, which they are about um, linking individual different forms of IDs together so that they all work together rather than replacing them with a single piece. Um, just conscious, um, we're running short of time uh, and in particular I know that I'm supposed to be on the next panel so um, perhaps uh, we can, unless panelists have any more comments or there are any urgent questions, we can wrap up and continue the discussion in a very brief coffee break um, before the next panel. And if you would, join me in thanking uh, our panelists for a very interesting discussion.